are defines how you build. Today we have a super special guest. I am so delighted that we have Chip Heath here. Uh, I've known him for many years and I am a big fan of his work. He's written extensively about human behavior in the context of organizations. He's a professor at the business school right across campus, and he's a co-author with his brother of several really interesting books. Uh, one is called Decisive, How to Make Better Decisions in Life and Work, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, Made to Stick, uh, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Don't, and his newest book, The Power of Moments. I have to tell you uh, that I love this book. I got an early copy of it, and I started reading it and couldn't put it down. I think this is, honestly, I think one of the most important books they've written. Well, thank you. Yeah. I want to suggest John Grisham, though, for books that you can't <laughs> put down. You know, just, well, I really loved it, and I thought it was really important. So I'd love to know what motivated you to write this book with your brother. Yeah. So, so Dan and I are 10 years apart. This has been kind of a family bonding experience for us to work together. And, and so we get together at, at mom and dad's house, typically, when we're working on a book. And we had tried a couple of other concepts uh, that, that weren't working very well. And, and at one point, Dan said, what does it mean when people say that there's a defining moment? A defining moment in life, a defining moment in career? And we started exploring that, and pretty quickly, we became fascinated with this idea of some, some times in our life are more impactful than others. And so, you know, there are certain moments in a vacation that stand out in the vacation. But there are also certain moments in your university career that stand out. And it turns out if we asked you five years from now or 10 years from now, those of you that are still undergraduates, what do you remember from your college career? 40% of your memories would come from the first six weeks of freshman year. That's what studies show. And, and why is that an impactful time? Well, it's the first time you're on your own, the first time you're doing things by yourself, you're, you're going out to a party and nobody's checking up on you when you come home. Um, People remember graduation, but junior year is like a black hole of, of memory. There's nobody, nobody remembers anything from junior year. So juniors work on that. You know, try try to do something that is memorable. Maybe that's a good argument for studying overseas. And and so it, it occurred to us that some things stick with us and some things don't. And some things matter. Why don't we take more control of that? And what could we do in, as a business to create defining moments for customers or for, for ourselves and our families? I love the fact that you use an acronym, and then in the book you kind of throw it out because you think it's a little bit gimmicky. But I love the acronym because it really helped me. The acronym is EPIC for Elevation, Insight, Pride, and Connection. Can you talk about this? Because I think what you're trying to get at is that there are certain moments in our life where we are primed to have a defining moment and that one can leverage that to actually make them even more valuable. Yeah. So, so what, we, what we found after asking lots of people for what are the moments that mattered to you most in your career, or what are the moments that mattered to you most as a family, or what were the moments from your last vacation that stood out, there were certain themes that came up over and over again. And so that's where epic come from. And, and we don't like that because not all of the moments that we're talking about in the framework have to be epic. And we can't resist hearing that surfer dude you know, saying epic. Uh, so, but but that's, the, that's the framework. Elevation is moments of sensory experience. And so if you've ever stood in a national park and seen the beautiful views, that's a, that's a moment of elevation. If you've ever seen a fireworks show, uh, if, you've, uh, if you've enjoyed a favorite food, I mean, birthday cupcakes are the classic distillation of sensory experience. You've got sugar, fat, and flame all in one, <laughs> one little compact object. Uh, EP, uh, pride. So moments of pride are moments when we set out to achieve something and we actually achieve it. And in, in the moment when somebody recognizes you for that, so certain, certain professions, like uh, military people, are smart enough to wear uniforms that signal their pride in their position. They have a chest full of medals that show you the experiences and the skills that they've acquired. Uh, that's a source of pride. But basically, whenever somebody says, you know, I saw what you did and I really appreciated that, that's a moment of pride, and those stick out in our mind. Uh, insight, moments of insight are not always pleasurable. And that's one of the mistakes, I think, that we make in talking about consumer experiences is that they all have to be delightful. There are lots of moments of insight that are, that are oh-no moments, you know, and, and so we may decide this is not the job for us or, or I've stretched myself too far on this project. But moments of insight are powerful because they tell you something different that you can do for your life or your business or your, the, play, the game that you're playing. Uh, and so those moments are important. And then finally, connection. And these are the most profound moments in life, the moments with our families, with our friends, uh, with work colleagues. And so feeling that, that bridge, that connection with another person is, is tremendously valuable. So 
this is the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Lecture Series. And of course, you're a thought leader, but a lot of these folks in the audience are hoping to be thought leaders in the future, leading organizations, leading teams. Why is it important for someone in a leadership position to understand this? I mean, is this just about birthday cake and candles? Or why in an organization should I be worried about defining moments? Well, I think there are, certain, there are certain moments when you can make a big impact on your employees or on your customers, and these are the tools that you have available to you. So uh, one of the stories I love from the book is John Deere, classic American company to make tractors. And in this country, a lot of people know John Deere because we're only, most of us are only a couple of generations from people that actually farm the, the ground. Uh, but it, as you enter China and India, there, there's not that history, there's not that connection. And so they, they took something that is an important moment of life, but we typically don't honor it much. It's the first day on the job. And, and I don't know about you and your last job, but the typical experience, I think, of, of the first day on the job is you show up, and the person at the reception desk is really happy to see you, but they, they actually thought you were coming in early next week. You know? and, and so somebody will stop by and, and, and rescue you and take you to your cubicle, which is the, the, the monitor's there, but the CPU unit isn't hooked up, uh, and, and the person is late for a meeting, and so they kind of drop you off and, and they grab for a, an employee manual that's sitting in the, in the cubicle from the last owner and say, well, here, why don't you look through this for a while? And so you spend your morning reading expense reimbursement policy and, um, and assorted other technical things. Uh, finally, somebody right before lunch takes pity on you and whisk you around the office to meet 23 people who are themselves late for a meeting or late for lunch, and so you feel a little guilty for interrupting them. It's not an optimal experience as a first day. And so what John Deere did is they said, let's, let's design this so that it makes an impact on people. And you only have one first day on your job. So what they did is they assigned everybody a texting buddy. And so you've been texting back and forth with this person. And, and they tell you what, where to, where to, how to get to the location. They tell you how to uh, dress for the first day. But they show up and they, they hand you your favorite beverage. So caramel latte or the chai latte or you know, whatever it is that you've been talking about. Because they work that into the text message. On the monitors on the front wall have your name on it, say welcome, you know, Chip Heath. And, and as the person takes you to your cubicle, there's a banner that stretches up a little bit above the cubicle farm, a couple of feet above. And so people can look across and see that there are new people on the floor and then stop by at their leisure during the day. Your first, the monitor is set up, it's hooked up, and it's showing beautiful pictures of screenshots of tractors. And you wouldn't think that there are beauty shots of tractors. But you, get, <laughs> you get a tractor out in the sunset and you're plowing the last few rows before the evening and it's, it's a beautiful thing and it's scrolling by. And you, you, you click the screensaver off and your first email is there from the CEO of John Deere. And he appears in a little video and he talks about the 175 year history of this company. This was a company that was founded by John Deere. He had a patent for a plow that looks pretty innocuous, but it was a plow that, that was less likely to foul up with roots as you're plowing the ground. And over on the side of the desk, there's actually a little toy model of the plow. And so you look at this thing and say, 175 years ago, John Deere got a patent on this because he saved farmers time and allowed them to plow more. And the CEO talks about the fact that this is a company that's devoted to helping the world have more food and more shelter. Those are two needs that we desperately need. And so he says, welcome to the most important work you'll ever do. And you know, we hope you'll have a long history with John Deere. Uh, your manager stops by right before lunch and says, you know, I'd love to have lunch with you tomorrow, but today I'd like you to go out to lunch with a few of your peers. And so you meet up with four or five of your peers at lunch. They talk about the projects that they're working on, why they think they're important. And so if you think about the end of that day, we, elevation. Sensory experience, eh, there's not a lot there, but you got your favorite beverage in the morning. You got the, the model of the plow that you can pick up and hold in your hand. You've got the beautiful shots of tractors. A lot more on pride and insight. I mean, you may not have known the history, the 175 year history of this company. You may not have thought about the fact that I'm doing work that I could be proud of because I'm helping people eat. I'm helping people have shelter over their heads. And connection is just off the charts. You've got your texting buddy, you've got the people that you meet at lunch, you've got a, a first email from the CEO. And that's a good first day. And in fact, the reaction was a lot of people that had been in the company before they started this program. It's like, can I quit so I can go back and have that as my first day? Now, my question to all of us is, why isn't every first day kind of like that? And I don't know, I don't know how, we good, how good we do orientation for, for, for freshmen, but you know, was your freshman orientation like that? Even if it was, was your first orientation towards your major 
because at some point you declare a major. And was that as good an overview of the major? Was it as motivating for you know, inspiring you to what kind of careers you could aspire to with a math degree or an electrical engineering degree or whatever it is? There, there are only a few opportunities that we have like that in life. Why aren't we seizing all of them? You know, it, most people have seven, ten jobs in, in life, and so. Well, I love that story, and I think I know Stanford does a big deal with the first day of school. You know, I know that uh, they they spend a lot of right. time designing that experience, but that's in the first day. How often do you need to have these to keep you motivated? I mean, is it something you should do something every month? You know, a milestone every year. Um, I'm going to guess that this is, you know, after the first day, if a year later you haven't had any more of these defining moments, it, it sort of uh, dwindles in impact. Yeah. And I think the answer for that is there's, there's room for more. And, and I don't know what the right limit is because I don't think anybody's pushing that limit. And so, you know, think about projects that we have. Do we, do we always take the time to celebrate you know, the end of a project and acknowledge, you know, well, we did a good job on that, or here's what we could have learned from that. So looking for moments of insight or looking for moments of connection with people. At the beginning of projects, we don't always take the time to have dinner with people that we're about to work with and exchange stories of, you know, what, what we liked and didn't like about previous projects. So I think there are small ways and large ways. John Deere, first day orientation is a big way. But if you're, if you're celebrating a project that failed, you know, why not have why not have a miniature wake for the project and you know, drink beers and tell stories about you know, the, the work that you put in you know, uh, and celebrate it? We actually had a fabulous talk here, if, and maybe some people have seen it, uh, where Astro Teller was here talking about at Google X, mm. uh, the process they go through when they end a project. It's quite dramatic. So okay. you might want to find yeah, out that, that story. It's a great, great example of creating quite an experience around ending a project. I think it's also interesting about the little tiny things that you describe that can be done. My favorite example, and I'm sure that other people remember it also from the book, is about the Popsicle phone. Can you talk about that? Because as a customer, often there are things that you can do that dramatically change your experience with a, a company yeah. uh, with one little tiny thing that they did to, to really surprise you. Yeah, at the time we were writing the book, there, there, there was a hotel that ranked in TripAdvisor's top three hotels of uh, Los Angeles, and it's called the Magic Castle Hotel. Now, the number one hotel is the Hotel Bel Air, which is a Hollywood boutique hotel. There's a massive pool that has its own weather system you know, because it's so large. <laughs> there are, the, the rooms have bespoke wood furniture, high thread count sheets. You can control everything in the room, the drapes, the $3,000 stereo system with an iPad controller. Um, the floor is heated, which is absolutely critical in those terrible, horrific Hollywood winters. Um, so that's, that's the Hotel Bel Air. Um, the, the, number three is the Four Seasons. And what's not in the top three is, is the W, the Ritz, you know, all kinds of brands that have their own Los Angeles hotel. Number two is Magic Castle Hotel. You look at it, and it looks suspiciously like a 1960s apartment building because it is a 1960s apartment building, painted canary yellow. Uh, the pool is nowhere near the size of the Hotel Bel Air. Um, the rooms are not particularly, I mean, it's more Ikea than bespoke wood furniture. Um, there, is a, there is a controller that you can use to control the lights and the drapes. You say to your child, honey, could you get up and get the lights for it? <laughs> and voice activated uh, works. But, <laughs> but the Magic Castle Hotel is, is not nearly the physical plant that you would expect from a number two hotel. But what, what is true is that if you go to the snack bar right, in your room, there's a long list of things that you can order from the front office. And it has, it has Kit Kats, it has Cracker Jacks, it has grape soda, it has cream soda, it has much longer, about 30 things that are available, all for free. And if you've ever had the, the, the mistake, I mean, the mistake of eating, having the salt craving at night and having the cashews, you know, and realizing you wasted a sixth of your tuition for that quarter, you know, <laughs> This, this is a very different experience. But the thing that people always remark on is by the pool, there's a phone, a red phone. Looks like a Cold War era relic you know, that the President of the United States could use to call the premier of the Soviet Union. And if you walk over and pick up the red phone, uh, well, above the red phone is this saying, sign painted. It says, Popsicle Hotline. And so you walk over and you pick up the red phone, and a voice on the other end says, we'll be right out. And a few minutes later, somebody walks out of the front office with white gloves carrying a silver tray, and they pass popsicles around the, the pool. 
and the kids are beaming, the adults are beaming, there's no better recipe for happiness than a cold popsicle in a warm Los Angeles afternoon. And what's remarkable about that, and what's remarkable about the snack foods, is for less than the Hotel Bel Air spends on chlorine tablets for their massive pool, they are creating happiness. And they do it reliably and systematically. Uh, if you check into the Magic Castle Hotel, the desk clerk is primed to ask you, you know, is there a special event that you're celebrating here? And occasionally people say, well, we're here for John's birthday. Well, in the back, there's a person who's eavesdropping. And if they say something like, you're celebrating John's birthday, there are a set of cakes in the back and some cake decorating equipment. And so they quickly scrawl, happy birthday, John. They grab some of the balloons that are already inflated there. And they, they practice this, they do dash, room dashes. You know, practice getting to the room with the cake and the balloons without spilling anything. You walk into the room, you know, and the couple that has just introduced themselves five minutes earlier to the front desk, they walk in and there are balloons there. There's a cake that says, happy birthday, John. And they go, how did they do that, All right? And magic. that's magic, that's magic. And, and that's what they're going for, those wow moments. And the amazing thing is, once you see what they're doing, it's so easy. And yet I walk into, I walk into hotels all the time, and the Hilton, the Marriott in San Francisco looks just like the one in New Orleans, it looks like just like the one in Austin. Why don't we walk into every hotel room and there's a, a drink and a snack that exemplifies local cuisine that you'll only get there? I mean, why, wouldn't, why shouldn't we have a sense of place about things? And, and so the Magic Castle is doing stunning work very inexpensively just by thinking about moments of elevation. I love it. I yeah. mean, I think those are things we can do every day. We can do for our friends and family, right? Yeah. Yeah. So can you do it for yourself? Can you decide to create your own defining moment? Or does someone else have to do it for you? I, I think if, if you're not creating your defining moments, you're, you're missing opportunities. Um, and especially in graduate school, you know, the ability that you have to meet interesting people on a university campus like this, that ought to be a source of lots of defining moments. The time that we take with friends, and this is not easy, right? It's because it's hard to coordinate schedules, especially with the busy people you're at. But if you, don't, if you don't take a road trip with friends every once in a while and do something unusual, you're, you're not taking advantage of the time that you have in graduate school. And so, you know, go see the Northern Lights. Go, go to Iceland. And, and stay in an ice castle, you know. Uh, and you may think, I, I don't have enough money to do this, but your credit cards are already highly leveraged. <laughs> and what finance professors will tell you is that there's this life cycle of income that says, you all are gonna make, be making good salaries in a few years. The, the amount that you have on your credit cards now, you're gonna be able to pay it off eventually. So charge extra. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Business school professors just gave you permission to do so, that. So I'm thinking, going back to organizations, I mean, I, I love that. I'm going to start defining, creating some more moments in my life. But let's say you know, you're running an organization. Should you actually have a chief experience officer? You know, somebody, mm. you know, we, we're now starting to get you know, people who have roles who look at the business from different perspectives, whether it's security or innovation. Should be there a chief defining moments officer? I, I think the chief HR officer ought to be a chief experience officer because your employees deserve moments in their careers that are celebrated and rewarded. I mean, when, when people become managers, there's a big shift that you make from being an individual contributor to working through others. And so we have the, the whistle, the coach whistle award that is given to people that says, this is the moment at which I shift from being on the field to being off the field and helping others achieve in their career. So the chief human resource officer ought to be chief experience officer. Chief financial officer ought to be chief experience officer because the amount available, we, we quote a study in the book, for every person that you can move from neutral about your product to a 10 out of 10, really positive fan, you earn $9 for that person. For every person you move from dissatisfied to neutral, if you could solve all the problems, you'd earn one buck as opposed to $9 for making the neutral people more satisfied. Chief financial officer, if they want to be serious about revenues, ought to be thinking about moving all the people that are whelmed by the product, neutral about the product, all the way up to raving fans. Uh, chief operating officer ought to be thinking about routines for this. But look, the, the CEO, the chief experience officer ought to be the CEO, the chief executive officer, because that's what your organization is delivering. And, and no matter what, what domain you're in, you're delivering experiences to your customers or clients. And that, that shouldn't be a, a, a separated audience, 
So I'm, I'm, a, I'm against chief experience officer. Okay, but the point is we all should be. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the point, yeah. is that we all should be looking at that, at everything we're doing each day and saying, how could I optimize this experience for myself, for my team, for my customers? Are there some things that can't be optimized? Some experiences that, you know, you know what, we just got to write that off. Or can everything be? I, I like to run the thought, and I'm an author, and I've been thinking about experiences, so of course I'm going to believe that everything can be optimized. But let's take, let's take one of the, the most basic moments that we have in our culture, which is happy birthday parties, right? We do a pretty good job with those. We, we've got elevation, we've got the cupcakes there, we have music there, we sing songs to people, we bring together their friends and family to celebrate the birthday. But imagine if you added one or two other elements of the framework to that moment. So insight, how would you get insight on your birthday? Suppose you had filled out every year of your life on your birthday uh, a little note to yourself about what you learned that year. I, I think it would be fascinating to go back and look at what did my eight-year-old self say was the most important thing I learned that year, or what did my 25-year-old self? I, I shudder to think you know, what, what I would le have learned some of those years, but I think that would be a moment that would make a birthday more meaningful. Uh, time capsules, if, you, if you're a parent, some parents are smart enough to mark the height of their kids on the door sill so you can see how much you've grown in the last year. What if you had a time capsule for your, your kids that you put together every year that had a math homework and a list of their friends and a list of the shows that they used to watch, and, and they could look back two years and say, that math is so easy, and I was still watching My Little Pony. Can you believe how, <laughs> how much I've grown? So, so I think if, if we took some of these principles and built them in to even good events, we might have potential for creating even better events. Great. So in a couple minutes, I'm going to open up for questions so you can start thinking of your burning questions. So um, when you create defining moments, some of these things are making you more comfortable, some of them, but some of them make you uncomfortable, right? They, they get you out of your comfort zone and you're doing something different. Is there a trade-off between sort of feeling alive and feeling comfortable? Is a, is a significant part of... of uh, creating defining moments, sort of just getting you off your defined path? I think that's, that's part of it. Um, so doing something novel is always, is always good to, to make something memorable and remarkable. And, and I also like the insight that it's not always positive moments. So, so one of the most popular courses at Harvard is actually run out of the Career Counseling Center. And one of the things that they do with audiences like you, and especially those of you that want to be entrepreneurs, is they say, what are your goals for the next five, 10 years? And everybody writes down their goals. And then they have this exercise where they say, okay, take out your, take out your, your calendar, your, your phone, you know, whatever, whatever mechanism you use to keep your calendar. Look at the last two weeks. Shade in the times during those last two weeks when you're pursuing that five-year, 10-year goal. Mm -hmm. And people do that exercise and it's like, oh no. You know, it's like I had nothing in the last two weeks pursuing that five-year goal. That's not a positive delight moment of delight, but it is a profound moment because we realize that how little, unless we take time, how little we are pursuing the goals that we say that we want to pursue in the course of a normal existence. And so, so I think defining moments are moments that change our trajectory and, and move us towards goodness, but they're not always positive. Because I'm thinking, uh, when I was reading the book, I was thinking of the experience I had uh, being in Paris and being on a, uh, the Ferris wheel, the big Ferris mm. wheel in Paris, and uh, getting stuck at the top in the middle of a lightning storm. That was a defining moment. Um, so I, I'm going to guess, how many people in the room have had like been on a vacation and the most memorable experience was something where you had a flat tire, or you, know, you got lost, or you ran, lost your wallet? I mean, these are, these are moments you remember and recount to people. Yeah. So often those moments are ones that you might not want to relive, but that were ones that are very memorable. Yeah, and I think, I think especially, you know, the military knows this for sure because boot camp is filled with negative moments that bond you with mm -hmm. other people that, that are going through them at the same time. And, and so a lot, of, a lot of, if you're a manager and you're in charge of a group in the future, taking the time to celebrate those miserable times that you spent together doing the last crunch for a deadline or the, the late nights, those are the sorts of those are the sorts of stories that are going to bond you to, to your colleagues. Well, you know, it's interesting. I always in my classes on the team projects, I always make them do at nine in the morning as opposed to nine the prior night mm. because it means it's more likely the teams are going to stay up all night doing it, 
And Clever. yes, of Clever. course, they could have done it at nine at night and been done and submitted it, but most work all night getting it done. And that changes dramatically their experience of the project because they did something that felt really hard together. Yeah. And it's good preparation for life in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just a little, a little tweak to change their relationship with the project. So uh, let's see. First question from the audience. Who's got something? Yes. Thanks for giving the talk. Um, so I think over the last 150, 200 years, we've seen a progression of value from uh, commodities to goods to services and now experiences. As experiences potentially become more commoditized, what's the next stage? So, can you the question? Yeah. So, so the question is, we've had a, a shift in the economy from, what was it, products? So commodities, goods, uh, services, and now experiences. Commodities, goods, services, and now experiences. And the question of what's next after experiences. If you'll forgive me, because I just finished a book on experiences and published it last fall, I'm not quite ready for experiences to be done yet. Um, <laughs> and, and I think there's a long way to go on experiences. I mean, we, we are not celebrating. We are not making moments of most of the things that we should make. Um, so you don't get a note from the bank when you pay down half your mortgage saying, congratulations, you've paid down half your mortgage. Teachers in classrooms in elementary school are probably not celebrating the 500th book read by their class in, in the, the school year. Right? There are lots of opportunities for experiences that we're not taking advantage of. So I, I haven't thought about what's next. I love the question. Um, but. We, we have some work to do on experiences first. We'll talk again. Yeah. Are there ways to make bad experiences less memorable? I mean, let's say somebody's going into the hospital and you know having some some terrible thing happen to them. Yeah. Um, you know, and they really want to make it less of a defining moment. I think it's a great question, and it's one that we we largely punted on in the book because. We don't want to systematically create bad experiences for people. But there, is some, there are some hints, and there's a very interesting literature. You've heard of uh, post-traumatic stress. But there is an interesting literature that has studied people that have had awful things happen to them, you know, health problems or natural disasters or, uh, or accidents, and have rebounded from that. And it's called post-traumatic growth. And the post-traumatic growth literature, if you read it through the lens of what makes defining moments, is interesting because, for example, they'll say that one thing I learned in the hospital while I was struggling with cancer, and radiation, and chemotherapy, is that the small comforts, the small pleasures, were really meaningful. You know, so a, a, a dessert that somebody brought me that tasted good, or uh, the hot towels that the nurses would bring around at night that smelled like lavender. You know, those are moments, little sensory experiences that, in the midst of that, hospital experience are, are, are powerful for people. And I, I, don't know if there are, I don't know if there are dietitians at hospitals, but I think the last time you need a dietitian involved in the thing is hospitals, because what you ought to feed people is ice cream, cheese, you know, what, whatever feels good. Chocolate <laughs> is, is, is wonderful. Um, but if you listen to people who have gone through those post-traumatic growth, they say connection is really important, that I learned who my friends and, and people I could count on really were, uh, that moments of pride from, from achieving a course of treatment. Um, so, so I think some of the same principles would help us get through even bad events, but we don't talk a lot about that a lot in the book. That's a really, really interesting insight. Do we have another question? Yes. So um, I think I was wanting to build up on her question. Uh, but the comment, I think some hospitals I've seen now, they are like spirituality and meditation rooms and stuff. But uh, to her question, uh, if you keep yourself in the realm of experiences and not wanting to go to the next thing, in experiences, do you think of like different experiences that are coming up now, classifications, so that things are changing, types of experiences, if you can elaborate on? So the question is, are there changing types of experiences? I think I've got to vote for what needs to change, and and I think it relates to the conversation that we had earlier about you know all are all experiences all defining moments positive. We've spent a lot of time in consumer experiences talking about moments of delight. So that's the magic castle, you know, the popsicle hotline, the the, the free snacks from the the snack bar. Um, but I think moments of insight, and especially in B two B context, are very powerful. So an interesting book came out a couple of years ago called The Challenger Sale. And we typically think of salespeople as managing a relationship. So they're there for you. They're there 24-7. They're responsive. And there are an important subset of salespeople that are rated, that score high on that dimension of just service orientation. 
But the salespeople that are most valued by companies, that the CEO of the company says, this was, this was the most meaningful sales relationship I had, are actually what they call challenger salespeople. And challenger salespeople are not there for you 24-7, you know, helping you with service. They're there challenging you and your picture of your business and your picture of your industry. And what, what the ratings say is that these challenger salespeople are highly valued by customers and clients. They say, it's because they changed the way that I thought about my business. You know, I thought I was doing this, but they pointed out that I'm also doing that, and I needed some tools, additional tools for doing that. They showed me some things about the industry that I hadn't known before. And so being able to bring that moment of insight, even if that insight is sometimes painful for people who are receiving it, that's a very valued thing. And, and I think that's, that's a place I would push us, is to think about what are, the, what are the experiences that matter in all forms, all emotions? You know, so what experience connection? What are the experiences that lead to loyalty? It's not clear that those are always the positive emotion experiences. They're, they're a sensation of people caring for us. And uh, so my favorite example of that is, why, why should I log on to Yelp every time? So I, I'm a foodie. And every time I'm in a new town, I open up Yelp, and I search for restaurants. And every time I have to take their sort, which is some combination of value plus distance plus advertising revenues or whatever it is, and, and say, I want it sorted by rating. Because I'm willing to drive an extra mile to, to eat the finest burrito or the best pad thai in the city. I have never once, even though I'm from Texas, I've never once clicked on a steak place. And so why in every, every town do I have to ignore 10 steak places that show up in the top rankings because I'm never going to click on those? Our technology, we spend a lot of time talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence and big data. There are patterns of behavior that we have with our technology that are not being picked up, even though we do them every single time. Every single time I log into Expedia, I have to tell it, I don't want to see the one leg flights, the one stop flights, I want to see the non stop flights. And by the way, helpfully on that first ranking, they show you the two plus stop flights. Who takes those? You know, it's like travel masochists, you know, that want to want to stop in lots of places on the way to they're their destination. They're creating experiences they're, along they're the way. They're creating experiences. <laughs> like walking up and down that jet jet bridge is is really exciting. So why should I have to tell Yelp uh, or Expedia every time nonstop flights and sort them by departure time as opposed to by price? You know, that's ways that technology could benefit from us, and and all of those are ways of establishing connection. That I understand you. I'm caring for you. It's not a big aha, wow moment of delight like the Popsicle hotline, but it's, a, it's a, a constant reliable thing that technology is either doing or not doing to tell us we're understood and we're valued. So this begs the question though, how do you know which experiences to amplify, to optimize? You know, we have a thousand experience through the day. You know, you get up, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, you have breakfast, you exercise, you commute to work. I mean, there are an infinite number of things that happen. How do you choose which ones, whether it's in your work or your personal life, that you know, you know, this is the one that I should really focus on? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question in general. Um, but, but what I would challenge you to do is to spend time experimenting. And luckily, there's so much room to experiment that that I think you're going to hit something pretty quick. And so, for example, when we talk to companies about how much time they spend solving problems, fixing problems, as opposed to creating upside experiences, the typical ratio, the median and the mode, is to say we spend 80% of our time fixing problems and 20% of our time thinking about upside. If your company has only spent 20% of its time thinking about upside, there are lots of opportunities. Pick, pick one, pick two, and start experimenting. And, and I think what you'll see is there should be a very fast feedback cycle because when you get, when you get one of these moments like the, the Popsicle hotline, you're going to see such a dramatic change in the customer's reactions that you'll, you'll, you'll know very quickly if you're onto something. Yeah, I think of an experience that I had um, that dramatically affected me. I I'm, I'm wonder if you've seen this. I've actually now seen it in a few other places where a restaurant, you get to the end of the meal and they give you a little you know, bag of granola or a little muffin for breakfast. And you go, wow. Like They have just created something that costs practically nothing that I know the next morning I'm going to get up and have you know, the meal essentially continue. That's beautiful. Yeah, and you're thinking back to the restaurant the previous exactly. night. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think we, we miss all kinds of opportunities for that. I mean, why, why doesn't every restaurant present you with a little amuse-bouche taste, you know, whatever the restaurant is? And I've done that 
gone to restaurants a couple of times and that happens and you just feel warmly about that restaurant from the very start of the meal just because they brought you a little a little vegetable something. appetizer. Yeah. yeah, something. The question right here. Yes. Why do we need uh, these moments? Or to put it differently, that we lose somewhere the ability to experience these moments? Uh, say the last part of your question again. Did we lose somewhere in history the ability to experience these moments? Why do we need these moments? So I guess the question is, you're thinking that maybe we've lost our ability and we need to sort of amplify what we're doing because people in their everyday life are not experiencing things fully. Yeah, I, th I think what our, what our brains are designed to do is to highlight pools of opportunity and pools of pain, right? And so what we, what we tend to remember from any experience, we remember beginnings and ends because transitions seem to be important for, for organisms maybe moving from one environment to the other, and we remember highlights. But a lot of the stuff in the middle tends to wash away. And so, for example, I, I rode Space Mountain at Disney World for the first time when I was in college. And what I know from the records that they keep is that the average wait time for Space Mountain is 60 minutes. And Space Mountain, to my surprise, was not the 10 minute ride. Well, I, I actually thought it was probably five minutes. It's actually two and a half minutes. right? But this is one of the best roller coasters in the world because not only is it a good roller coaster in and of itself, but they put it inside a dome and it's completely black. And so when you take off in the roller coaster, they have the, the you're going into space and you launch out and you're dodging asteroids and zooming by the, the, the rings of Saturn. And I thought it was one of the best things I'd ever done. Now, in retrospect, I don't remember an hour of wait which is kind of remarkable because that was a painful hour. I hate waiting in those queues. Is on a ten point scale, it's probably a three, so it's it's below neutral, but it's not awful. You know, you can do it. But what I remember is that ten out of ten, two and a half minutes. That in my mind had expanded to four or five minutes, right? And and I think that's one of the paradoxes that Disney understands that most of us don't understand is that our brains are wired to think about highlights and and pits. It's not wired to think about all the emotions in the middle. And so the paradox of Disney is that most times, if, you're, if you ping people at a random time during the day at Disney World, most of the time they're probably less happy than they would have been sitting on their couch at home. Because Disney World is in, I mean, it's was, it was built on swamp. It's 90 degrees, it's 90% humidity. You know, there was no wonder that Walt Disney, when he looked around for 51 continuous square miles, found, found land at Disney World because it's a swamp. And so it's not structurally designed for people as a vacation spot, but it is a set of people that think seriously about peak experiences. And so even if we're, we're kind of vaguely miserable a lot of the day, there are those peak moments that make it one of the best experiences that we and our family have had in the year. I'm reminded of you know, some period of my life where I had a lot of learning experiences, you know, a lot of defining moments. I said, these are all character building. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, OK, I have enough character. Can we stop? Yeah. You know, can you get to a point where you're just having too many defining moments? Yeah. And I, and I think there, there are stress, stress indices that say, especially if your defining moments are the <laughs> aha, I made a mistake, right? we, can, we can satiate on those. Um, yeah. So, you, so, so let me ask you, can you have um, an organization so focused on this that it actually becomes um, a decrease, there becomes decreased efficiency? Can you get, can an organization have too many defining moments? I think it, I think it could, but, but again, what I want to, what I want to argue is that we we're so far from that perspective, you know, ask people, ask people, have, have, has your organization celebrated you enough shown a sufficient gratitude for all the work that you put in. And 80% of the people in, in the world, employees, say, you know, my manager doesn't recognize my performance very often. And 80% of managers say, I'm recognizing performance all the time, right? I'm constantly showing gratitude towards people's performance. And so there's this gap between what the organization thinks it's doing and what the employees think the organization is doing. And I think anything we can do to bring that together is, is a good thing. Great. We have another question. Yes, back here. Oh, when he was uh, the head football coach of Notre Dame, Lou Holtz was asked, how do you motivate your players? And he said, are you kidding? They come in here motivated. My goal is not to demotivate. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, within the context of defining moments, 
it seems to me that most demotivation happens with inertia and erosion rather than some big demotivating event. And so is your is the thinking that you can re-inject motivation to people who are kind of losing steam? This, the, you want to repeat? repeat yeah, so the question is, you, in many cases, people come into situations, a new job, uh, a football team, motivated. Are, is the role of uh, defining moments to essentially maintain that motivation as opposed to increasing it? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, and I think if you think about why people are coming into that job motivated, it's because there's a moment there that you're, you're excited about the potential to explore something new, the potential to use your, your hard-won knowledge. And, and so I agree. I think it's a lot of cases just preventing that from seeping away is, is an important thing. And, and you've, you've done it in your class by giving them the project that's due at 9 a.m. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm motivated. I'm motivated enough to stay up all night. And you've given them an opportunity to do that. Yeah. So I, I love some of the examples in your book about um, using these defining moments to actually incredible learning experiences. You tell a story about, I can't remember what country it was in, where they were trying to uh, influence people's behavior related to um, hygiene. And that they created these experiences that were aha learning experiences. Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't think I can talk about that to a family audience. Uh, but but uh, how much do you bleep Bleep the... That's okay. We can mark it as explicit if you okay. need to. All right. So for, for those of you listening with your family, you want to turn off, fast forward past this anecdote. Um, so the, the story that Tina is referencing is a story about open defecation. So there are lots of communities in the world that don't have closed off toilets and it causes health problems. But there, these communities have spent years with open defecation. And so the manipulation that they do is an insight manipulation. And there'll be an observer that goes in and starts walking around the village, just making notes. And the kids suddenly see the stranger, and they start following him around. And the stranger is carefully coached to be asking questions, not making statements. But they also phrase the questions in the most visceral, provocative way. So they'll start saying, do people always shit here? And people say, the kids are saying, yeah, yeah, they always say, uh, it's interesting. Do, do, dogs ever, do dogs ever come in this area and, and sniff the shit? Yeah, they do. do. Do the chickens ever come and eat here with the, with the shit? And, and so eventually there will be a crowd that forms around this person. And, and the person is trained to keep asking questions. And, and they'll say, for example, they'll pluck out a hair and dip it in a pile of shit and swish it in a glass of water and say, would you drink this? Oh, no, no. Well, how, how big is this compared to the legs of a fly? Well, it's smaller. How many legs are there on a fly? Six. Do flies ever visit the shit and then fly in and land on food in your house? And so this tension starts building as the community starts being confronted by the fact that they have for years been eating and drinking shit. And eventually somebody will say that. And, and, and if, they, if they question the person in the meantime, they're saying, are you saying that we're eating shit? No, I'm just here asking questions. I'm just recording this for, for a study that we're doing. And what's powerful about that moment is, is it's not like the community doesn't know at some level that these problems are there. They've seen the dogs playing in the shit. They've seen the chickens pecking in the shit. They've seen the flies going back and forth. But having that crystallized, short duration experience with that is a powerful moment. And what this group has successfully done is converted thousands of communities to, to taking seriously the notion of closed toilet systems. It has profound health impacts. But without that intervention, the communities probably would still be going on that decades later. I think it's, I mean, it was a certainly a memorable story in the book, and uh, you told it beautifully. For, for those of you tuning back in, <laughs> that, that, is the, that is the last of the visceral language. But, but they, use that, they use that language because what they're trying to do is shock people. And they're consciously trying to give people motivation, in this case, that hadn't had motivation to change. And that visceral language really helped. Okay, but shouldn't all educators be experienced designers? Yes. Because 
what percentage of the material that we learn in school do we just totally forget because we haven't been given an experience that makes it memorable? Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's a challenge for all of us as professors and teachers in other levels. I mean, think back to your, your history. Uh, how many of you can name three defining moments where you, as, a, as a kid going through school, you remember an exercise or a lesson or a, a topic that a teacher took, tackled because it's, it stands out in your mind? How many of you can remember three of those from your previous experience? I'm hoping some of my students raise their hands. <laughs> All right. We're, we're in a very distinguished, for those of you tuning in from outside, we're in a distinguished audience of 150 people. Um, and about 20% of the people are holding up their hands. These are people that have had access to the best educational experiences that we deliver. And my question is, why don't we have 30%? Why don't we have 40%? And that's why when, people are, when people mean, are saying, you know, what, what happens when we, when we get too many of these things? I, I think we're so far from too many of these things. It's like all of us deserve at least three defining moments in our, in our trajectory up until undergrad at, at Stanford. So what do we do? What can we do right here in this class to create more defining moments in this class? Um, Here's, here's one suggestion. In, in the projects that you're assigning, I think you, you need to assign harder and more rigorous in projects and make them due at 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm extrapolating. But one of the, the tools that we found in, in connection is there's a very interesting social psychologist named Art Aaron, and he went through a procedure. He created a procedure to bond people and make them best of friends in 45 minutes. And so you take two randomly selected undergrads, and they go into a room, and they start answering questions. And the first questions are simple. You ever sing in the shower? Yeah, I do that. You know, if you could have lunch with anybody in the world, uh, who would you have lunch with and why? And so the questions start out easy, but 15 minutes later, there's another envelope of questions. And you start drawing from that envelope, and the questions are a little bit deeper. And the, the third 15-minute segment, the questions are, you draw a question like, if you were to die today, what would you regret not having said to someone? And why haven't you said it? And so this, this two randomly selected undergrads are going through this process of <laughs> gradually revealing more and more of themselves. And if you ask them after 45 minutes in this exercise, you say, how close do you feel to this person that you just met 45 minutes ago? And you compare their responses on the scale to another group of students who are asked to, to rate the most powerful, closest relationship in their lives. And so people in, in, in another sample are rating their, their best friend since high school, their, their mom, you know, their, their significant other. People, people that have just met each other for 45 minutes score about a third of the way into the distribution of the most powerful relationships that people have in the other sample. And I find that remarkable. What it says is that we're only 45 minutes away from really close connections with lots of people in our life. But what we never do in most situations is take that step of getting beyond the weather, getting beyond the sports, getting beyond to something more meaningful. And so I think one of the simplest things that you all could do to make this class more impactful is start with an interesting question. Like, you know, you're here and there's so much focus on entrepreneurship. What worries you about whether you are going to be a good entrepreneur or not? Because you know, all of us would aspire to be that. But what is it that you feel like stands in your way? And I think if we had that discussion, that would start us out with closer connections with people than, than what we normally do. Wonderful. That's a great suggestion. So we'll, we'll experiment with that. Yes? You talked about the six moments that people remember. If you think about past years after you got your tenure, what are the three peak moments in your academic career? So what are your peak moments in, peak in your moments. academic career? Um, after tenure. After, after tenure. After tenure. Um, I started teaching right around tenure time a class on making ideas stick. And there was one exercise that I do at the beginning of that class where I hand graduate students a sample of statistics from the Department of Justice and, and have them construct a two and a half minute speech either defending or, or contradicting the idea that property crime is, a, is an important problem for the United States. And so I had planned out this exercise because I wanted to create a defining moment for my students. And the first year, I ran it, and it was beautiful. So people got together. They spent 12 minutes scripting their, their, their pitch. They got together, and seven people in a group made a pitch 
about property crime in the United States, and then I distracted them for a few minutes by playing a Monty Python video. And then I asked them to write down everything that they remembered about the, the speeches that they just heard. And there was this embarrassed laughter in the crowd, and all of a sudden people realized, I don't remember much of what anybody else said. And the things that they did remember were things like stories, were things like um, emotional appeals, were things like if they used a statistic that did stick, it was on the form of property crime is going to affect 20% of the people in the nation. What that means in, is in a group our size, you and you might expect that in the next five years you're going to be experiencing a property crime. So they make it tangible and concrete. Uh, so that was a defining moment for me because it was an exercise that led to the eventual publication of my first book. <laughs> But it was the first time I, I tried that exercise in class, and it just worked so obviously to people that they were going, wow, I need a course on making ideas stick, because I just tried, and I failed. And that was, that was a useful exercise. So that's one defining moment. Uh, I'll give you one more. Um, we started doing a course with social entrepreneurs. And, and Tina and I were talking about uh, this, uh, this topic. Um, but course with social entrepreneurs, and the final day they had to present their mission to us. And what's amazing is that even people doing really important good work are talking about it in a very abstract way. And so one group was talking about, um, in, in Africa, they're trying to solve the problems of uprootedness, um, orphan behavior uh, by creating community around kids that have been dislocated by, and, and we listened to that, and we said, you know, what are you, what are, what are you doing? And they said, well, we have, we have a place. A lot of kids in our country wind up without parents because AIDS and war have, have wiped out the adult population. And so there are kids that will hike 100 kilometers to come be with our group. And, and they said, what, what, what we believe is every child deserves a family, in a home, in a community. And like when they said that, people's eyes got moist. And he said, why don't you take that and put it in place of that abstract jargon about dislocation and, and orphanage? And, you know, there, there are ways that we miss talking about even the most profound things in the world that are simple and concrete. And that was a defining moment for me, because it was like the, the, the reason we had the course was to help people clarify their intentions and their strategy and their mission. And I think that was a good example of where we did what we tried to do. Yeah. Kat. I, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the landscape around these peak moments. To what degree do you um, select or engineer um, the time and place when you can create these defining moments for people? the anniversary of their birth or the first day of their job strike me as being uh, moments that already have some expectation built into them. I, I have been in the habit for a while of asking people what the best meal of their life has been, and I've discovered that's always just another way of asking the question, when were they hungriest? Mm -hmm. and, uh, in other words, I think it might be, I'm wondering if you can build a mountain more easily on a plane than in a mountain range. It is, it's a great question, and, and I suspect that there are some people, there are some people that we might not want to work for, who are specialists in 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 turning up the temperature and making things difficult enough that when a breakthrough happens, we we feel really good about that. And so one of the characteristics when people in business schools teach power and politics, and they have the feature characters like Lyndon Baines Johnson, or Steve Jobs. One of the things that people always say about these individuals is they can make you feel so awful about yourself and what you've done, but they can make you feel so good about what, what you've done. And I think that, that discrepancy, you know, if, if I'm down here and then all of a sudden I do something right and Steve Jobs praises me, I think that discrepancy sometimes make, makes leaders more powerful. I'm not going to recommend those tactics, but I like, I like what you're what you're observing is that the best meal in the world is probably the time when we were most hungry. Do I want to engineer hunger? No. But I do want to say if you're trying to bond a group of people, you may want to create a boot camp kind of environment where people are doing something difficult that is meaningful and important. And if they do the all-nighter in Tina's class, I think they're going to be more, more happy about the, the eventual bonding experience of having, having achieved that. Yeah. 
I'm curious, any um, insights about the difference between uh, peak moments that you're sort of cognizant of as they're happening <coughs> versus the things that only in retrospect kind of stand out as, as really meaningful? It's, it's an interesting question. So the question is, do you understand peaks at the time or some are only clear in retrospect? When we survey people about that, it's about 50-50. And we haven't, we haven't figured out what makes the 50-50. Um, but I think a lot of times the insights take a while to percolate. And so we realize in retrospect that was, that was a turning point for us that took us in a productive direction. Um, but we didn't realize it at the time. Uh, but it's a great, great question. So I have an idea. I think we should use the last three minutes of this class to create a defining moment. Okay. And what I'm thinking is we will thank you for profoundly for your talk and inspiring us and creating this defining moment. But I'm thinking what we should do is have everybody stand up and talk to someone they don't know and to ask them what they're looking forward to and make a real connection with someone new. What do you think? Should we do that? I think I want to up, I wanna up the ante, up the okay, ante a little out. bit. Um, ask, them, ask them what worries Ask okay. them what worries themselves the most about, about being in Silicon Valley. OK. Maybe, maybe we could do both. What are you excited about, and what are you most concerned about? Beautiful. OK, great. Let's thank our wonderful guests. Thank you, Chip.